Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and our minds with your word this morning. Lord, help us not only hear the word, but to live out the word this week in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So why did you decide to tune in to our digital liturgy today? You know, I think if I took a survey of all the people who uh, are watching this, I'm sure I would get a different response from every single person. But I do think if I went a little deeper and ask you, what is your habit? Why do you want to hear more about God? In almost every case, it would be because of somebody else who encouraged you to connect with God or to pursue faith in Christ. Maybe it was a parent, a friend, a grandparent, somebody who you looked up to that led you to consider faith in Christ. Well, today I want to tell you a little bit about my story, about why I'm here today. And then we're going to talk about 1 Thessalonians and why that church uh, came to grow in their faith and be a strong uh, community uh, of believers. So it all started when I was uh, very young. I grew up in a home where my mom would, I had two older brothers, and then I had a sister who was just two years uh, older than me. And I remember my earliest memories of sitting in a chair on my mom's lap with my sister uh, next to me. And my mom would uh, read us this children's Bible at night. And I was very young. This was before kindergarten. I remember her reading all these different stories in the Old Testament about Daniel in the lion's den, Noah's Ark, all these uh, you know stories that you hear so oftentimes in church and in Sunday school. And I also remember when I wasn't feeling good or I was sick, my mom singing that old song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, For the Bible Tells Me So. And I remember her, uh, if I wasn't feeling good or I couldn't sleep, soon after she would sing that, I remember falling asleep. Um, and those early memories uh, um, were very foundational in my life. And I have another memory that came very soon after that. And I was in first grade. And you're going to be like, how do you remember this? Well, you'll understand in a minute. So it was first grade, and we had what they called field day at the end of uh, the school year. And I was super excited about it, because in field day, you did all these crazy games. You got to do things that you didn't get to do before. There was always good food, hot dogs, and whatnot. And anyway, our first grade class, we were so excited that we weren't listening to our substitute teacher that day. And he got very mad at us, and so he canceled field day for that day for us. And we had to lay there and put our heads on the desk. I was so mad. So his name was Mr. S. And you'll, I'll, you'll understand why I still remember his name. So on a piece of paper where I had my head down, I got it out and I wrote Mr. S, M-R-S. It was all pretty close together, right? And then I wrote damn, um, but I spelled it wrong. It was like a river dam instead of the curse word damn. And anyway, and I wrote that down. I crumpled up the piece of paper and I tried to toss it to my friend who was in front of me. Well, Mr. S saw that note and he intercepted it and he unfolded it and he said, what is this? Well, he thought Mr. S meant Mrs. MRS and thought I was talking about my regular PE teacher, Mrs. D. And he's like, she's going to be so upset when she finds out about this. If I tell her about this, she's going to be very disappointed in you. And I was so scared that Mr. S, even though I wrote the note about him, was going to tell Mrs. D that I had wrote these things about her and it was really to him. But anyway, so I let it go, but I felt really guilty about this. And I remember one day my mom was reading the Bible, my sister and I were there and all of a sudden tears start coming down my eyes. And I told my mom about what I had done and expecting to get, you know, in trouble or spanked or something, you know, my mom said, look, um, you know, you're forgiven. God loves you. And I don't remember if those were quite her exact words, but I know that's the way I felt afterwards. It felt so good to confess what seemed so huge for a first grader's uh, you know, life at the time. That foundation of reading the Bible with my mom, having parents that took me to church, it was huge in my life. It was foundational. But as I became a middle schooler and a high schooler, church became less exciting. I started to space out during church and just not pay attention to anything that was going on. And then as I got into high school and got my driver's license, I became much more concerned about sports and girls and parties. And pretty soon I was completely disconnected from God. I remember going to one youth group and like, this is just not, I'm not into it. But I had a mom that was still praying for me. I had a dad that modeled what faith looked like. 
And I remember my junior year, we had two guys who had gone to the local college uh, near me. One of them was named Dave. And uh, Dave and uh, Joe was the other guy's name. And they showed up to our high school. They were Young Life leaders. Young Life is this international youth ministry that works with high school uh, students and middle school students now as well. And anyway, um, they would uh, come out to our school. I didn't really know what this Young Life thing was about. I knew some kids who went to it. But they started to befriend me and my friends. They knew our names. It wasn't in a creepy way. These are college guys we kind of looked up to, right? Or just out of college. But uh, when they would come to our games, they would remember our names. They would. I remember our football team was very mediocre that year, and they remembered all my plays and uh, how I did in the game. Very complimentary and in a real sincere way. Slowly, I started coming out to the youth group meetings called Young Life Club and uh, um, really wasn't soaking in much of the message about Jesus, but I was still going. There was a lot of pretty girls who went there. And later um, in the spring, I heard about this week-long camp in North Carolina at a Young Life camp called Windy Gap. And I decided to go mainly because there was a girl I liked that was going, but also I had some friends who went the year before who seemed pretty normal and they encouraged me to go. And I remember one of them was at dinner with my parents and he was telling my parents about the camp. And he said, I'm not sure Steve would want to go uh, because it's kind of a Christian camp. And, uh, you know, I don't think he's really into that. And I'm sure my mom and my dad were like, oh my gosh, what has come to become of our son? But sure enough, I went to the camp and uh, had the time of my life. Um, got to hang out with my friends, these same uh, Young Life leaders who had been at the school. Um, and every night, the speaker who was there would share with us about the love of Christ about how God loved us, that he sent his son to live among us, to die on the cross for our sins, rose again, the hope of the resurrection. And one night we had to go outside and take like 20 minutes and we had to think about what God had done for us. And I remember laying on this hill and I still remember the scene and looking up at the sky, the stars and realizing that I didn't wanna live my life for myself the way I had been. I wanted to be reconnected with God. And it was at that night I said yes to Jesus. I said, you know what? I don't know. I didn't have all the right words. I wasn't a theologian or anything like that. But I knew that um, I wanted to be closer again to God. And at that night I said, you know, Jesus, I want you back in my life. At the end of the week, we had this thing called a say-so. It's from a psalm that says, let the redeemed of the, of the Lord say so. And so I stood up at the... Uh, at the end, along with a bunch of other teenagers from my high school and from other high schools all over the country, and said that my name is Steve Chisholm, and this week I give my life to Christ. And you know what? It was a great reminder. I can't say my life was perfect afterwards, but it was different, kind of like when I was in first grade and I felt that guilt for writing that uh, note to uh, Mr. S or Mrs. D, as he thought. I was, um, uh, I became convicted about things in my life that were not of God. I began to want to make changes in my life. See, the Holy Spirit was working in my life. I was recognizing what God was doing in my life. And through the years, um, at first it was my parents and then these youth leaders, and then there's been countless other believers that have demonstrated to me what faith in Christ means. These countless followers that I've come in contact with have modeled me, modeled to me the life of faith. As we began our sermon series last week on Thessalonians, Pastor Bennett talked about Paul's uh, beginning ministry to the Thessalonians as Paul and Silas went there. And uh, this letter to the Thessalonians is a letter of encouragement. Paul, like my young life leaders way back then, modeled to these uh, people in this region called Thessalonia about what it looked like to follow Christ, about what God had done for them through Jesus, about the power of the resurrection. And the people responded to this good news. They, like me, they stood up and said, I believe, and this church was formed. And so this letter was written to encourage this group to stay the course, to not give up. You see, this church, as uh, was indicated in Acts and uh, in this letter, as you read the letters in Thessalonians, had experienced a lot of persecution. It was not easy for a believer in Christ. You had the, uh, there was persecution from the Jews who didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And then there was the Roman persecution who said that Caesar was God, Caesar was king, and that Jesus was not king or God. And if you worshiped him, your life could be in peril, in danger, right? 
So in its beginnings was not easy. So this letter was meant to encourage these believers. First of all, in the letter, we learn that um, right away that Paul has a message of prayer for the leaders. See, Paul uh, always wanted the main thing as he, when he was helping these churches grow to be about Christ. As I heard once uh, many years ago, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And so for Paul, um, as one of the apostles, he understood that the main thing was Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection, ascension. That message needed to be preached and lived out. That's why in Romans uh, chapter 8, that famous verse says, Know in all things we are more, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as Paul opens up in prayer in this letter, he begins with these words of encouragement about the love of God. He says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, in your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, love, inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul begins this letter to remind them of the importance of the main thing, about their hope in Jesus Christ. You see, pr prayer not only connects us with God, but helps to encourage the others that we're praying for and with to remind them and us that we're part of God's story, to remind them that God loves them, that God loves us, that Jesus Christ came to redeem us all and to bring us home. Prayer connects us to the life of God. You know, I had uh, parents that prayed for me even during that time or the times in my life when I've been far or what I thought was far from God. And I found out later when I uh, became a youth leader and I also went on staff with Young Life, like those guys who came to my high school, that that ministry was founded on prayer. And I found out later that there was people that were praying for all those, all of my, me and my friends in high school as we went to camp. They had a committee of adults that would pray for us by name. See, there is power when we pray in the name of Jesus. So Paul begins his letter that way. Secondly, he reminds the leaders of how that him and Silas had modeled to them of what the Christian faith looked like. He writes these words. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with our words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep commit conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You see, leaders help secure the growth in young, in young believers. They help them to depend on the reliance and the power of the Holy Spirit. A good leader does that. A bad leader makes it all about them and says, you know, it's all about me. You know, put your faith and trust in me. But a good Christian believer is a see-through servant who helps point people to the God who can change lives. And that's what Paul was doing right there. He was reminding them that we lived among you. We showed you who Christ was. We modeled this. Good leaders live out their faith among the people. See, this idea of modeling the faith and sharing life with one another is emphasized throughout this first letter to the Thessalonians. In chapter two, which will be preached on in a couple of weeks, it says this, so we care for you because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul understood the importance of living life with people, not just talking about it, but living it out, living out the love of Christ. That's why, this is why he reminded the Colossians, uh, in his letter to the Colossians, he says this, to them God has cho chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That all of us carry this message of Christ in us, and we're supposed to live it out. We are signs that point people to Christ. God chooses us as the body of believers to live this out. This is a common theme in the letters in the New Testament. You know, my own life, it was lived, uh, lived out by my parents. It was lived out by these youth leaders. And as I said before, countless other people who have shown to me 
what it means to follow Christ. Well, the church responded to Paul and Silas's ministry. You see, they saw it lived, it out, lived out among them and they imitated them. Paul writes, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. When the message is modeled, especially when things are difficult, people understand that this message is bigger than them. They can't do it just simply by, I'm going to do everything you did. See, Paul modeled to them reliance on the Holy Spirit. And so they relied on the same Holy Spirit by praying and by connecting with God, by relying on the Spirit's power. And this helped them to have joy even when they were going through struggles. You see, it was a power that was much bigger than them. I have a friend right now named John back uh, from where I lived in Hilton Head who's going through uh, skin cancer, and it's been like stage three. It's been very difficult, uh, his journey, as he's been fighting cancer. But through this uh, struggle that uh, he's been going through, he's been a huge encouragement to me this year in this transition as I moved to Miami. He sends me books uh, uh, you know, to help me to grow in my faith. He prays for me. I call him up, and I pray for him. He's an example of a believer who has shown to me the power of the Holy Spirit to have joy even when you're going through hardship makes me want to imitate that as I go through my little ups and downs in life as well. Uh, Paul continues to write about their, uh, how they imitate and how they model the faith and says, and so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you all over those two places. And also it says your faith that God has become known everywhere. Your reputation of getting known everywhere comes not just from your words. They were living this out and people saw it. They saw the love of Christ, even in difficulties, this joy in them that they hadn't seen in other people because it was something bigger than what a group of people can do on their own. They were connected to the living God who loves them and they were showing it to other people. You see, they had a testimony. They had a before and after, how they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and people were noticing. They had a story. They had their lives, and they were people who embodied their hope in the resurrected Christ. People were noticing. You see, it was not one of these things where it's not, don't listen to what, uh, listen to what I say, don't listen to what I, don't, uh, um, sorry, don't, but don't do what I do. You've heard that before, right? You know, listen to what I say, but don't do what I do. No, that's not what they were saying. It was like, listen to what I'm saying, but more importantly, watch me live it out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let my life speak. People were noticing. See, this church was growing through prayer and reliance on the Holy Spirit. Through the examples of Paul and Silas and later Timothy, who would be sent through this church, older believers who helped model the faith to them to remind them on their reliance of the Lord. And they became imitators of this, so much so that people from everywhere, not just the surrounding cities, heard about their faith and they wanted to know more. They were thriving in spite of a hostile culture because the gospel has power to change lives. So let's go back to you. Again, I don't know why you tuned in here today. I know all of us have our stories. I know all of us have our reasons. But regardless, like any message, as I shared my testimony and the testimony of this uh, church in uh, Thessalonica, we can hear something like this. It can go in, in one ear, out the other. We can forget it a couple days from now. But one thing we can do from this message, I want you to think about somebody who's encouraged you, somebody who's still living, who's encouraged you in your faith and reliance on Jesus Christ. And I want you to do something this week. I want you to send them a text message. Uh, email, or better yet, go old-fashioned, write them a letter. You might have to go buy a stamp from the post office, but make that effort to encourage them about how they've encouraged you in the faith. This will be huge. For those of you today who are maybe saying, you know what, I really don't have that say-so moment. Well, maybe today is the day that you remind yourself about what God has done for you, that you say yes to God and no to self. C.S. Lewis says that when we do that, we become more ourselves than ever. That's what conversion is. 
when we say no to self and yes to God, he gives us back our true selves, our lives. So maybe today is the day that we do that for the first time, or we reconnect with God. Maybe like me, you push God away, like when I was a, a teenager. Well, today is the day for a new start. You know, finally, for we as a church, I want to read a quote to you. It's from Gary Hogan, the founder of International Justice Mission. If you've listened to some of my other sermons, I'm sure I've quoted this before. But he said these words, What's God's plan to make it believable to the world that God is good? We are the plan. There is no other plan. See, Gary Hogan, who has this uh, uh, ministry to bring justice to places where people don't, children who become slaves or uh, people who've experienced all kinds of injustices throughout the world. He helps through the, his um, legal background as a lawyer to find ways to free people who are trapped in all kinds of bondage and slavery. You name the evil in the world, they've gone and battled that. But even though that may not be our ministry, our ministry of believers encompasses that same thing. We are called to be the plan to set captives free, to tell them about the good news of the gospel that breaks the chains of trying to live lives for ourselves, which always brings us down a dead-end street. Just like this church in Thessalonica, we too have a testimony. We are called to be a church that prays and recognizes our need for God, to think about those who've modeled the faith for us, to read in scripture all these great stories of believers, and to live that out, to be imitators of that, because the world just doesn't need to hear it or read it. It needs to see it. Now is our time to live this out. As the old gospel song says, they will know we are Christians by our love. I want to conclude with the prayer from Paul's, uh, um, in the very beginning of Paul's uh, letter to the Thessalonians that I read earlier. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We have hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, let's live out this hope this week because the world needs to not only hear it and see it, but to experience lived out in believers like you and me. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill us with your hope, with your love and endurance this week to live out individually and corporately the hope we have in Christ. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.